It's a great uh, privilege to be with you. Uh, this is kind of fun because um, as Tucker was talking about uh, preaching in these services this weekend, uh, you've been going through the book of Acts, and uh, that's one of my favorite places. It's that summary that uh, Dr. Luke wrote of the early days of the Jesus movement after the resurrection, what happened then. And in there, he's outlining what life is meant to be like among the people of God. And uh, particularly in chapters uh, 13 through 17, he uh, crystallizes, uh, sort of in summary, the messages that the Apostle Paul uh, gave in his different mission situations. Paul, the uh, former Saul, Rabbi Saul, the Jewish rabbi who sat at the feet of Gamaliel, one of the leading historical teachers of Judaism during his time, during the time of the early church, and uh, was dramatically turned around and brought to faith in Jesus uh, and became the Apostle Paul. So in there you find these summaries of the way that Paul would address different groups in the Roman Empire of his time. Uh, in uh, chapter 13, you find a summary of the message that he gave in the Jewish synagogues, uh, people that had a background in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, the early church, uh, the, what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, uh, that was their Bible. Uh, the Psalms were the prayer book of Jesus in the early church. And uh, these were people that he was addressing that understood the one and living God as the reality of, of life. Uh, so he took his message and crystallized it from the passages in the Hebrew Bible. But then in, verse, in chapter 14, we find him and his uh, partner in missions, Barnabas, who had helped him move along and uh, join the early believers uh, after he had been converted. We find them traveling in uh, what we now call Turkey, Asia Minor, in some of the major provinces of the Roman Empire. And uh, he's out uh, a ways from the, the coast. He's in an area called Iconium. And he's uh, confronted there with pagans, people who didn't have a clue about the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, Iconium in that area, yeah, I suppose you could kind of compare it to Boise. Uh, these were educated people. Uh, I tell my German friends in Berlin, Boise is not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. And um, so here they are. They come to uh, this area, and we start now in chapter 14. I'd like to read with you the first 18 verses of uh, this passage, because I think it will help us focus our mind. And I'd like you to look as we read through. There's an issue of communication going on here. Um, I don't know if you're into Charlie Chaplin movies, but this is the closest to a Charlie Chaplin movie you'll find in the New Testament. Uh, you'll understand that remark in just a moment. Uh, so I'd like you to think about communication and then about the division uh, between the crowds and those who turn and follow Jesus. And finally, what I'd like to center on with you a bit later this morning is the reality of the living God. So, uh, let's go. Acts chapter 14. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. You may have a different translation. Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to follow along. Now, at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the unbelieving Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they continued to preach the gospel. So here we are, Paul and Barnabas at Lystra. Uh, 
Now at Lystra, there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking and Paul looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well said in a loud voice, stand upright on your feet. And he sprang up and began walking. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying in Lycaonian, uh, the local language, which Paul and Barnabas obviously didn't speak, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. Um, Hermes, the Romans called Mercury, the messenger of the gods. He was always talking because he was taking messages from the gods to people. Uh, sort of indicates Paul's role in this. He was speaking quite a lot. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates. This is kind of a circus and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, heard of it, they tore their garments, rushed on into the crowd, crying out, Man, why are you doing these things? We're also men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to the living God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. Now, vain things is an expression that comes from the Hebrew scriptures, from the prophets. Uh, the prophets were always um, against the vain things, the idols of the nations. Sometimes it was dripping with sarcasm, like in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah says, look, you cut down a tree, you cut up some wood and you build a fire and roast your hot dogs. And then the rest of the wood you turn into an idol that you bow down and worship? What kind of an idea is that? So vain things, he's referring to things that are worshiped that are different from the living God who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and all that's in them. And he says, in past generations, this living God allowed all nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he didn't leave himself without witness for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. Paul contrasts where this society, this culture in Lystra is with the reality of the living God. And we're going to come back to that thought. Uh, this did not end well for Paul. Uh, a bit later, his enemies from another city, some unbelieving Jews came, stirred up this same crowd. They drag him out of town. They stone him, leave him for dead. Uh, the disciples gather around him, and he uh, lives and escapes to preach again. But... There's another story in the book of Acts, in the early chapters of the book of Acts, where the two leading apostles, John and Peter, are walking into the Jewish temple. They're going through one of the gates, the beautiful gate to the Jewish temple. There's a beggar there who also is lame, asks them for uh, a gift, an alm, and he says to them, uh, please give me something. And Peter says famously, Silver and gold I don't have, but I'll give you what I do. Stand up in the name of Jesus and walk. The man stands up. He begins running through the temple, shouting and proclaiming what's happened to him. A wonderful spiritual movement takes place. Literally thousands of people end up coming to faith. It's a wonderful story. Paul may have had that in the back of his mind uh, as this whole scene in Lystra started, but it didn't turn out that way. These people had no categories. They were in a completely different, different mental space. Where my wife and I live and work in Berlin, 70% um, approximately of the people below the age of 35 claim to be atheists, 70%. Most of them, many of them, have, haven't a clue about the background for the reality of the message of Jesus. Uh, I've shared this before here. There was a walkabout a number of years ago where a local TV uh, went through and interviewed people on the street. Uh, what uh, is Christmas all about? What is the meaning of Christmas? And I'll never forget this one young guy. He said, um, Christmas, I think it's a Memorial Day to Santa Claus. Uh, 
well, he wasn't an idiot. Maybe he was an idiot. Uh, but he, he was so far away from the background to the message of Jesus. And so what we see in the book of Acts is that when Paul was confronting people in that situation, he made a major rewind. He, he went back to the fundamental beginnings and he began talking about the God who made heaven and earth. I have a very dear Chinese friend who came to faith in Christ about four years ago. Uh, we spend a lot of time talking about culture and background and message and things. Uh, he was baptized recently. I had the privilege of baptizing him and his wife. Uh, but his challenge is, is that many of his people just have a zero concept. Where do you start with people like that? So anyway, communication is not what we say, but what our hearer understands. It's not what we say, it's what the hearer understands. And as you share your faith, perhaps, with people, be sensitive to that, that they may just not have enough information yet. And so don't be afraid to do what Paul did, is dial back and start at the beginning. There is a God who made the heaven and earth and all that's in it. Uh, the story of Jesus is embedded in the story of Israel, and that's embedded in the story of Abraham. And understand the story of Abraham, you understand the story of creation, and beyond that, the whole story of the cosmic situation and the war of light and darkness, and God is the reality. Oh, there's just so much. But that's where Paul dialed back to in confronting this situation. And in Acts chapter 17, which is another really favorite passage of mine, where he's confronting the uh, intellectual elite of his time in the Greek city of Athens, the philosophers, he talks about this and he says, God has made us. He even quotes their own poets. And he says, uh, God has let the nations go their own way. But now he's focusing things. This is the time where the living God is revealing himself. And he's going to judge the nations in the person of Jesus. Communication. Um, <clears throat> secondly, in verses uh, 15 and on, he speaks of the living God. And in doing this and in preaching the message, there's a division in the crowd. There are some that follow Jesus. His later uh, young accompaniment, his, his friend Timothy, came to faith in Lystra. This was where he came from. And uh, so there were some who came to faith, but the crowd was divided. The people were ultimately turned against him. I, I just want to give you a warning, and this is important in our culture right now. The people of the living God, those who follow the resurrected Jesus, will never win the world's popularity contest. James, the brother of Jesus, who became a leader in the early Jerusalem church, wrote, don't you know friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So be prepared, as Paul and Barnabas were, that there is a choice. You can be a friend of God or you can be a friend of the world, but you can't be both. Now, please make a note. This is not a general license for being a jerk. Uh, people that sometimes do and say stuff in resistance to culture, that it's not because of the message of Jesus, it's just because they're jerks. And I want to warn you about that, please. Uh, Jesus is the epitome of clarity, of boundaries, of love, and of kindness. And we're called upon to follow him. So Paul contrasts what's happening with this people, this society. He does the same thing in Athens. And he says, the living God, the one who has made heaven and earth, ultimately is going to be judging nations and cultures as well as individuals. And that's where I'd like to concentrate with you now. I believe that as a society, 
not just the United States, but the Western world, that we are confronting the living God very quickly. When a culture turns away from the living God, what happens? Well, the Apostle Paul lists that in the book of Romans. He says, uh, the result is when you turn away from the living God as a culture, there's all kinds of unrighteousness, evil, covetous, malice, envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. Sounds like a program summary of HBO. <laughs> People become gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. They dishonor parents. They're foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. This is the darkness of the Roman Empire that Paul knew intimately. We have this sort of romantic idea of Rome from films and, and, and TV programs. We see Roman legionnaires marching in their bright armor. Rome was a terrible place for most people to live. It was a dark society. Uh, people were just treated, it was, life was, to quote a philosopher, brutish and short, and for most people, terrible, except for the very small elite floating on the surface. And underneath was this cauldron of unrest. Uh, most of Rome could not be fed unless the grain shipments came from Egypt and Alexandria. Uh, it was a dark place. It was a culture of death. Think of the gladiators. The followers of Jesus presented a remarkable contrast to that. Even Roman writers were astonished that believers in Jesus cared for the poor. They nursed the sick and dying. When a plague broke out in a city, all the pagans fled. And the Christians went there to take care of the dying and the sick. They never left people to die alone, the Romans said. They displayed a generosity and spirit and in material help to other believers and outsiders. Women played an integral part in worship and were given status and respect. We don't have the time to look at it this morning, but in the smallest letter, the shortest letter of Paul in the New Testament to his friend Philemon, a wealthy man and a slave owner, interesting point, uh, he writes to him and he appeals to him to treat a converted slave as a brother in Christ, undermining everything that the Roman society depended upon in terms of status differences and everything, that we can't go there right now. He was planting a seed that would ultimately topple slavery in the Roman Empire. It's a breathtaking contrast to the attitudes of early Roman Empire and society, this culture of death. The living God. Paul says to the people at Lystra, the living God is going to confront you as a society. You need to deal with this both as a society and as individuals. In the rest of the time we have, I'd like to take a brief glance at those two things. First of all, as a society. I believe that we are approaching the situation of the Roman Empire in our nation and in the West far faster than we realize. It takes ethical energy to create a society where life is protected. And as the Bible demands, where the poor, the weak, and the stranger are not exploited, but respected and cared for. Our societies in the West have been living off the invested capital of previous generations of Judeo-Christian ethics for a long time, and we're nearing the point where the account is almost empty. I'd like to just look at one area of this. Uh, as uh, Tucker explained, I did do my doctorate in Germany in philosophy of science. Uh, a Dutch friend of mine said, um, you don't really need a doctorate, but it helps Europeans listen. Um, <laughs> integrity has turned optional in our society. Integrity today is labeled with a label that says, use only when convenient. It's, in my opinion, the real problem with political life. I'm not going there right now. Uh, it's the real problem, though, with political life in our society. It goes much, much deeper than any conspiracy theory. The issue is, is that integrity is optional. Example, science 
For example, medicine is dependent upon integrity. The whole basis of modern science is rooted in a Judeo-Christian ethic of integrity. You don't publish results that don't reflect the reality of what you've investigated. You don't omit information because the sponsor that happens to be sponsoring you doesn't like the results. It's a basic integrity or honesty that is the whole foundation of science. Marsha Angel, uh, a physician, a well-known, respected editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the flagship publications of medicine in the world today, wrote in 2009, she said, it's no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reached slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. But she says, you can't trust it. Why? Because integrity is missing. Richard Smith, who was 25 years the editor of another top peer medical journal, the British Medical Journal, wrote, most of what appears in peer-reviewed journals today is scientifically weak. Why? Well, another editor of the New England Journal wrote, people are making a zillion bucks out of the commercial exploitation of medicine. Just an example. Most of the physicians I meet, I, Anne and I, when we come back, do a lot of medical stuff because we have insurance here. Uh, most of them are people with integrity. They want to do the right thing. But the system is breaking down of science and research because of a lack of integrity. One's word today is no longer one's bond. It's a vaguely emotional intention to do what one's pledged to do if it's not too inconvenient. One more example, kindness. Kindness today is seen often as a form of weakness. There's a chilling rawness to much of entertainment. There's a harshness and exploitation of the weak. Children, kindness and social charity grew out of a Judeo-Christian worldview. This is disappearing. Look at the gladiatorial games in ancient Rome. A deeply anti-life culture, it's chilling to see. I don't mean just the slaying of the unborn. There's a gut rejection of otherness, a fear of change and, and someone that's different. There's a readiness to shoot first and ask questions later. This is a culture that is pulled back from the truth and the reality of the living God. So what happens to a culture? What happens to us as individuals when that happens? I'd like to talk to a t with you about a topic that's not very popular right now. It's the topic of the wrath of God. If you're British, it's the wrath of God. It's not a very popular topic, but we know in life that actions have consequences. I love John 3.16. God loved the world in such a way that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's a wonderful verse that we need to keep in our frontal lobe. But 20 verses later, the author of John writes, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains upon him. Wow, what in the world does that mean? Uh, back when I was in high school, in the late Stone Age, um, we had to read a sermon by one of the Puritan preachers of early America, Jonathan Edwards, called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Well, how's that for a title? I don't think that would work in Hollywood. Um, Jonathan Edwards, this is hair-raising, what he writes, but I'd like to share it with you because of his meditation on this. He said, God holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider Think of the black widow in your garage. Or some loathsome insect over the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. 
you have offended him infinitely. Wow. Billy Graham said, if God does not judge the United States, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. That is heavy stuff. What are we really talking about here when a culture or when we as individuals face the wrath of God? I've reflected on this topic for a long time and I've searched the Bible to try to understand what it really means. Is God some kind of abusive father that just kind of backhands you when he gets upset? That's not the God of the Bible. So what are we talking about? The problem we face is this, that we do not understand what is meant by the living God. The Bible describes God as a burning fire, intense, unquenchable, infinite love, but also unquenchable goodness and purity. A good friend of mine a while back, a um, number of years ago, he was present when some of the most powerful political figures in the United States, I mean really the most powerful political figures in the United States, were introduced in a private encounter to Mother Teresa, the little nun who started the Sisters of Mercy in Calcutta, the black hole of Calcutta in India. She was one of the moral authorities of a whole generation. And he said it was interesting to watch these powerful political people as they met her. They were trembling. They were literally frightened of this little nun who had no armies, no black box she was carrying around. Why were they dealing with that fear in the presence of this? Because they saw in her an incorruptible clarity a moral and a spiritual purity and authority. She was only a small reflection of what the presence of God is all about. God is infinite love. You will never meet a love like God has for you. But you will also never be in the presence of someone with such uncorruptible character of goodness and justice. And if you think that's not spooky, think again. C.S. Lewis, the um, Oxford and Cambridge uh, literary giant, uh, wrote a series of children's stories, which you may be familiar with, the Narnia Chronicles. And uh, in the first story, Narnia is a children's story. It's the, the, the chronicle of a, a, another land of, of, of talking animals. And in the first book, children from our world go to Narnia and they hear for the first time about the maker of Narnia, a lion called Aslan. And one of the characters, uh, Lucy, begins to get a little bit nervous about this. She's talking to one of the talking beavers uh, who's just talked about this lion and she says, um, is, is he safe? And the beaver looks at her and says, of course he's not safe. He's good. He's not safe. He's good. That's the reality of the living God. As I said, I've reflected a long time on this topic of the wrath of God, what it means for a society and as individuals. And I'd like to talk with you briefly about a story from the Hebrew Bible about the wrath of God. The people of Israel had been delivered from Egypt They'd gone through the Red Sea. They'd gone through the wilderness. God had sustained them there. They were led to Mount Sinai where Moses, their leader, climbs up the mountain to receive God's instructions about how the nation was to live. Think Ten Commandments, uh, some social rules as well. The people down, not downstairs, but down the mountain, uh, become impatient. They demand from Moses' brother and sidekick Aaron an image of a great, an idol to worship and he complies. Moses comes back down the mountain. Moses is really upset about this. God is even more upset. And now God says to Moses, this is a fascinating passage. This is the living God, the maker of heaven and earth, 
talking to his servant Moses, and he says, I have seen this people. Behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Think of a horse that doesn't want to lead. Stiff-necked. And then he says something that is fascinating. God says, Moses, let me alone. Leave me alone to this. Unimaginable. He says, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them. I'll burn them up in order that I can make a great nation just of you. Why did God do something like that? Let me alone? Was he just being arbitrary? No. He was giving Moses. He knew who he was dealing with. And he was inviting Moses not to let him alone. Moses, this is your call. That's a huge responsibility. But he said, Moses, if you don't intervene, let me alone. This is going to be bad news for Israel. But it says, Moses implored the Lord his God and said, Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people? Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore. And God says, right. He relented from the disaster that he'd spoken of bringing on his people. We can't often deal with the idea of the wrath of God because it's so polluted in our thinking with abuse and, and arbitrariness and uh, angry fathers and abusive people. God is not like that. But the wrath of God, I've come to the conclusion, is nothing less than the burning incandescent heat of his love and who he is as a true and pure God. He will never compromise who he is. He cannot. He's the living God. His wrath is the unshielded radiation of who he is. And we, I don't know if you've ever visited the atomic site, energy site in Arco. Uh, I did with a group of European students a while back, quite a while back. Uh, we had to put on outfits and little booties and we got tested for radiation when we left. Um, not a, something for the squeamish, uh, but radiation, these things are, are serious. And we are the problem, we have chosen all of us in our own way, to reject God and his way and join in rebellion toward him. If we stand unshielded and exposed to the pure radiance of his love and goodness, we're toast. The apostle Paul outlines this. He said, the wrath of God is coming. The presence, God is going to be on earth again. He's, the presence, his presence is going to be there. What are we talking about? On April 25th, 1986, I remember this day, there was an accident at a Soviet nuclear reactor about uh, 80 miles north of Kiev, the capital of the Ukraine. They were doing a test of the turbines and it went badly wrong at Chernobyl. Due to an operator error, the control rods couldn't be inserted quickly enough into the reactor to slow it down. When the cooling water hit the superheated nuclear fuel, there was a steam explosion, which created hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is notably explosive. Everything blew up. It killed about 30 workers instantly and blew radioactive uranium and graphite into the atmosphere. It was the largest uncooled controlled release of radioactivity into the atmosphere, apart from the explosion of nuclear bombs. In the following days, the Soviet government attempted to contain the radiation by dropping about 5,000 tons of boron, sand, clay, and lead by helicopter onto the burning core of the reactor. How would you like that job? These helicopter pilots who carried out this mission are the real heroes of the story. They gave their lives to contain this radiation. Now remember what we were talking about. God can and will never compromise who he is. He's the living God. He's perfect in love, goodness, justice, truth. The writer of the book of Hebrews challenges us. He says, let's offer 
acceptable worship to God with reverence and offer. Our God is a consuming fire. How can we humans, I speak for myself, how can we possibly survive the presence of that kind of reality? The radiation of his character, his wrath, if you will. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he said, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. God was in Christ. Now this is where it gets very interesting. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. For our sake, in Christ, God came. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God is immensely patient. It's his grace and mercy that's keeping us out of the incandescent fire of destruction. That, by the way, was the point Jonathan Edwards was trying to make. It's his mercy. But even more than that, even more than being patient, God in Christ stepped between us and the burning reality of God's goodness, truth, and love. He took it for us. He's absorbed the consequences of our choice against him and our rebellion. He's opened his arms to us. That's what the cross is all about. He has stepped between us, wrapped us in his own character, and we survive in the presence of the God who is unquenchable love and unimaginable purity. But we still do have a choice. We can reject his grace. We can go our own way. He loves us too much to force it. He invites us with open arms, but the choice is ours. We can choose the living God, or we can choose our own will and death, but we cannot choose both. God cannot contradict who he is. The choice is ours. Again, C.S. Lewis said, at the end of time, there are going to be two groups of people. Those that say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. That is the choice. In conclusion, I'd like to speak very personally with you. First of all, if you have said yes to God's love in Christ, I want to encourage you to be bold and live for him. The reality of that is this, that you will face opposition. It may be in your family, it may be at your workplace, it may be in your studies. Friendship with God does mean some enmity with the world, whatever that means in your life. You will be giving up something, but you will be gaining something as well. One of my heroes of faith is uh, Jim Elliott. He was uh, a young man who was ultimately martyred killed for his faith as he attempted to take the message of the gospel to the Alca Indians in Ecuador. Later, the entire tribe was converted. That's a wonderful story. But he wrote in his journal a couple of years before he headed to Ecuador, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He or she is no fool who gives what they can't keep to gain what they can't lose, eternal life. So be bold for Christ. If you know Christ but you're wandering, you're a distance away from him, please seek help from your brothers and sisters. Choose God, live. The Apostle Paul says if we sow to our flesh, we're going to reap corruption, deterioration, decay of relationships, of joy, you name it, but we don't have to live there. Every moment he still, with open arms, loves us. And finally, if you don't know God in Christ yet, if you're kind of sniffing around the edges of the faith, I want to encourage you to turn to him today. Don't wait for absolute certainty 
I can assure you that isn't available anywhere, not in science. Absolute certainty is a myth. We have enough certainty to take the next step, to make a decision, but we'll never have absolute certainty. And I would encourage you to take the first step toward Christ. If you're real with him, he will be real with you. The living God, Paul confronted it as he was in Lystra. We face the living God and the reality of his love today.